Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the power of breathing. Breathing retraining utilizing the Bradcliffe method with respiratory therapist Donna Turner. My name is Jill Hubick. I'm a respiratory educator uh, as well as a certified uh, respiratory educator and registered nurse with the Lung Association of Saskatchewan. I'm so excited to be here this evening uh, to welcome all of you to our webinar. As we gather here today, I want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. On behalf of the Lung Association of Saskatchewan, I do want to take time to thank the amazing and incredible healthcare providers and lung health champions. They certainly have gone above and beyond during this pandemic. We thank you for your service. Respiratory therapists have played a large role in the pandemic. And it just so happens that this week in, in Canada is Respiratory Therapy Week. It's a week where we celebrate the respiratory therapy profession and their dedicated and outstanding services in our country. So we're so thrilled to host our webinar tonight with a presenter who happens to be a dedicated, a knowledgeable, and very passionate respiratory therapist, Donna Turner. So to Donna and all the respiratory therapists out there, we thank you, we celebrate you, and we're so grateful for all that you do. Our presentation this evening is generously sponsored by GSK, a science-led global health company with a special purpose, to help people do more, feel better, and live longer. I'm pleased to welcome Marie Claude from GSK to bring evening greetings this evening. Thank you very much, Jill. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marie-Claude Besonnier, and I am from the Patient Engagement, Advocacy and Patient Affairs team at GSK. GSK is pleased to support this event tonight, the third webinar of a series of four. I know that there are many of you tonight, and thank you for being here, who are looking forward to hearing about the power of breathing. It is certainly a topic that we all want to hear from, but especially if uh, you have lung conditions. So I really wish that this educational webinar will bring you tools, ideas, and answers to help you feel better. Actually, it is GSK's mission to help people uh, do more, feel better, and live longer. And I want to thank the Lung Association of Saskatchewan to have invited us to be part of those events. And I especially want to recognize them to listen to their community and include topics that patients and caregivers have raised. The Lung Association of Saskatchewan is certainly a leader in lung health and their success and leadership is due to the amazing people who are part of it. So I would like to take a few seconds to um, send my warm congratulations to Dr. Brian Graham, winner of the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Awards, and to you, Jill, uh, winner of the 2021 Alan J. McFarland Staff Award. Thank you very much for your engagement and bravo for a well-deserved recognition. I wish you all a very nice evening. Back to you, Jill. Thank you so much, Marie Claude. We're so grateful for your support and we're also so grateful for you and all the good people at GSK. You really do help people feel better and live longer. The Lung Association of Saskatchewan offers a wide variety of support groups. They're all online. And as you can see, we have support groups in asthma, COPD, COVID-19, lung cancer, lung transplant, pulmonary fibrosis, sleep apnea, and in smoking cessation. These support groups are for patients with lung disease, people wanting to quit smoking, as well as for caregivers. And it's really important to have a place where we can come together in a safe environment to ask questions, share experiences, and offer support. All of these people that are members of our support groups have very different journeys. 
but they all have one thing in common. Their lungs have all been impacted in some way and so have their breathing. I think the tonight's power of uh, breathing presentation is something that is for everyone, but it's certainly a topic that has been requested by many of our support group members. If you're not already a Lung Association of Saskatchewan support group member, we welcome you. We'd like you to join us. And you can do so by just simply visiting our website at lungsask.ca. All right, following our presentation tonight, we definitely will have time for questions and answers. If you have questions for our presenter, please type them into the question feature on the webinar. You'll notice that on the control panel on your right-hand side. And don't be shy. Chances are someone else has a similar or the same question as you. So breathing is one way that we can all help reduce our stress and our anxiety. It's also a great way to just really feel better. And it also plays a big part in our overall well-being. However, poor breathing patterns can certainly trigger or even worsen some of our symptoms such as pain, anxiety, stress, fatigue, and many others. So awareness of our breathing patterns and muscle tensions are really powerful tools. We are very excited for tonight's presentation because we all have lungs. So it's important for all of us to find ways where we can utilize our breath a little bit more. It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you Donna Turner. All right, she's got quite an impressive bio. Donna Turner received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Saskatchewan in 1983 and a Diploma in Respiratory Therapy from State in Calgary in 1986. She's worked in acute care, home oxygen, and today she works at Cooperative Health Center in Prince Albert in Saskatchewan. Donna obtained her Certified Asthma Educator in 1999, her Certified Respiratory Educator in 2006, and she taught the Rest Check Educator programs for the Lung Association of Saskatchewan from 2007 to 2017. And I can say she is an amazing teacher. She was one of my teachers. I'm so grateful to have that experience. In 2017, Donna became a Bradcliffe Method practitioner. So without further ado, please welcome Donna Turner. Hi everybody, I'm very excited to present to you guys today on the power of breathing and um, just wanted to say hello and to everyone and, and so glad you could all make it and hope you get something out of the webinar today. All right, so we're just going to get started. My name is Donna Turner and I'm a respiratory therapist at the Cooperative Health Centre in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. I'm also a certified Bradcliffe Method practitioner. And Bradcliffe practitioners pay attention to breathing patterns. And we maintain that the first step in restoring and maintaining good health in both mind and body is to pay attention to the breath. The strongest muscle we have to breathe with is our diaphragm. And when we talk about improving breathing, we're talking about becoming efficient at using our diaphragm to breathe with good nasal abdominal breaths. To do that, we need to learn about basic physiologic and mechanical processes of breathing and then practice simple strategies to improve your diaphragm breathing. Sure, we're all breathing. You'll, you may all just say that, I'm breathing just fine. But by using our diaphragms to breathe, we will decrease the effort and energy we use to breathe. And this can help manage lung disease better but as you're going to see, there are many other benefits throughout our body that we could experience, and we're going to explore these. Breathe well, and you will be well. Breathing is the most amazing tool we have to help us through life, one of such simplicity that its power is easily overlooked. This tool doesn't cost a thing. It's simple and available to everyone and can be accessed anytime and anywhere. Breathing affects how we move, the way we think, the way we feel. So let's get started. All right, this is just a slide of my disclosures. And 
this is also a slide of disclaimer, just making sure that everybody understands that although every attempt has been made to provide accurate and dependable information in this presentation, there are other professionals who may have differing opinions and new information and change is always taking place. Um, and I want to make sure that you can't hold me responsible for any adverse outcomes that arise from the use of this information, the treatments and resources. It's important to exclude and or manage any significant organic disease as the cause of your breathing problems. Once these have been addressed by your health professional, improving your pattern of breathing can be an issue. Eight million breaths are taken by us every year. So that's a lot of breathing. So we better be breathing the best we can. If we think about how babies breathe, they breathe through their noses and into their lungs using their diaphragm 100% of the time. Their tummy rising and falling with every breath. They continue to use their diaphragm 100% of the time until they're about eight years old. When they need to move faster, climb higher, and they start to use the other mu muscles of breathing in their upper chest, neck, and muscles between and around their ribs. As we age, we should continue to use our diaphragm 80 to 90% of the time, but this is not happening for a lot of us. As we get older, we may have changed our breathing pattern for some reason, and we're going to look at some of those possible reasons later on, but whatever the reason, we may have made a gradual shift to shallower, less satisfying upper chest breathing. Relearning how to breathe with the diaphragm is beneficial for everyone. It encourages improved oxygen exchange, relaxation, slows the heart rate, can stabilize the blood pressure, and has the potential to improve mental performance and reduce negative personal and physical consequences of stress. Lots and lots of reasons to make sure that we use that diaphragm. So let's look at how you breathe. How many breaths do you take in a minute? Are you breathing to your nose or your mouth? Is your chest moving? Is your abdomen moving? I want you to place one hand on your upper chest and one on your belly. Breathe normally and then take a big breath in. I want you to focus which hand is moving first and most, upper hand moving up or is the lower hand moving out? It may be more accurate if you watch yourself in a mirror or have someone observe you while doing this maneuver and ask them what they see. A good diaphragm breathing pattern at rest should see the air go in through the nose and a gentle rise of the belly and then a gentle breath out. It should be rhythmical and regular with an exhalation about twice as long as inhalation. Northern, normal breathing rates at rest are in an adult, 10 to 14 breaths per minute. In a child who is eight to 12 years of age, 15 to 20 breaths per minute. And children that are one to seven years old, 20 to 30 breaths per minute. And in infants, 40 to 60 breaths per minute. So is breathing, diaphragm breathing a lost art? It's a good question. People today are becoming more sedentary and the world moves at a crazy pace with increased sources of worry and tension. And during the pandemic, this has just been huge change in our worry and our tension. Some of us are thinking more and using our bodies less. Some of us communicate all day with a computer screen, either at work or at leisure, becoming so absorbed that our shoulders tense, our breathing changes. We may be holding our breath and by the end of the day, we're exhausted. People need to realize how drastically inefficient breathing patterns can affect them. Sometimes when our breathing goes wrong, our health can start to fail. Inefficient breathing patterns affect people in different ways. Some have more fear and anxiety, while others may exhibit more physical symptoms, such as neck and shoulder problems, chronic pain and fatigue. Many are a combination of both emotional and physical factors. Chest pain, feeling tense, blurred vision, dizzy spells, feeling confused. All of these things and more can really be affected by inefficient breathing pattern. So what does inefficient breathing look like? When I took the Bradcliffe course, I figured I'd learned just a few things that would help some of our patients. I figured I knew how to diaphragm breathe because I'm a respiratory therapist. We, we deal with breathing all the time. We're taught, how to, we're taught about breathing in our courses. 
I quickly realized that I was not using my diaphragm properly, barely using it at all. So after lots of training and lots of work and lots of practice, I think I've mastered my diaphragm breathing now. But now I look at patients differently. I look at their respiratory rate and their pattern of breathing. I ask, I look at them and I ask myself, do they breathe fast or slow or irregular? Do they breathe up high in their chest? Do they breathe? Do they breath hold? Do they breathe through their mouth? Do they yawn or sigh a lot? What's their posture like? Do they sit up tall or do they slouch? What about that nose? Can they breathe through their nose? Do they look stressed or upset? So what does a patient with breathing dysfunction or inefficient breathing look like? Here's just one example. I had a patient come to see me. She was a busy working mom who was having trouble concentrating at work controlling her emotions at home, and was having feelings of anxiety and chest tightness for the past few months since having some relationship trouble. She was so short of breath, she couldn't cope with day-to-day -day activities. Her breathing tests were normal. She was, but when we looked at her breathing pattern, she was breathing into her upper chest and faster than the normal 10 to 14 breaths per minute. Once we pointed out what we were noticing about her breathing, she actually was able to relax and realize she could work on improving this herself. We worked on breathing retraining. We introduced and practiced breathing with the nose and diaphragm and relaxation techniques. She noted improvement within a few practice sessions. So before we get into actually retraining how to breathe with the diaphragm, we have to review some basic lung anatomy. And so we want to just review that looking at the lungs. They sit in the upper, in our upper chest behind our ribs. The heart sits in the middle of the two lungs. And below the lungs and above the stomach is the diaphragm. So when we take a breath in, oxygen in, carbon dioxide goes out. Oxygen keeps our brain, heart, kidneys, all our organs strong and healthy. Carbon dioxide keeps the chemistry or acid-base balance of our body within normal limits. Our breath is directly connected to the pH of our blood or acid-base balance of our blood. And our body will make adjustments with our kidneys and bicarbonate levels if we are lowering our carbon dioxide levels through breathing too fast. This change in our acid-base balance allows us to respond to danger more quickly, but in the long term can cause a decrease in exercise tolerance and other health issues. The diaphragm is a big three to four millimeter thick breathing muscle under those lungs that separates it from the tummy. It's a strong muscle used for breathing, but like any muscle, if it gets weak and thin, then when we're, or when it gets weak and thin, when it is, hasn't been used very much. In this video, it's demonstrating proper diaphragm breathing with the lower ribs flaring outwards the upper chest staying quiet and the belly moving outward with each diaphragm breath. The connection to the pelvic floor is also evident as well. When you watch this video, keep an eye on how that breath fills the lower part of the lung, not the upper part. The lower rib cage is flaring outwards and the tummy is also uh, moving outward with each breath. And if we think of it like the look at the diaphragm as a, like a trampoline. As the diaphragm flattens, we can see that the, the diaphragm is pushing down on our stomach contents. And that's why we get a bit of a, a, a belly moving outward with each breath because that diaphragm is flattening and pushing down on the tummy. And actually very important part of diaphragm breathing is how important it, how it affects our, our belly and our, our intestines and helps to almost massage them on every breath, helping you to relax even more.
If we look at lung disease and diaphragm breathing, the importance. Trapped air in lung disease patients can press down on that diaphragm, which makes the diaphragm weaker and it works less efficiently. And that's just the nature of some lung diseases more than others. And during flare-ups or worsening of lung disease, asthma or your COPD, the breathing will change and we may breathe into our upper, into our, um, upper chest, which is less efficient, making us more tired and less energetic. When we use a diaphragm to breathe, it strengthens and in time, we'll use less energy and effort with every breath. If you wanna use a device to help strengthen the diaphragm, you need to be using the diaphragm efficiently first. If you start to use any of these, these are just a few of the um, devices that are available that people would tell you are good to help strengthen your diaphragm. But if we were to loosen up mucus, that kind of thing. But these devices really rely on good diaphragm breathing as well, because we don't want to use a device and, and increase the tension or the strength of the upper chest muscles. We want to improve and strengthen the diaphragm. So it's really important that you learn how to diaphragm breathe before you start using these devices specifically. So an important part of good abdominal breathing is breathing through the nose. So don't ignore the nose. The nose sends a signal to the brain. When you breathe through your nose, it sends a signal to the brain to relax. The nose cleans the air we breathe using nitric oxide and the fine hairs inside our nose. With all the blood vessels lining that nose, the air is warmed as well before it enters our lungs. So for some people, breathing through nose can be difficult, and this may be due to physical problems, allergies, structural or nasal lining issues, and this poor nasal function may have contributed to developing a breathing pattern disorder. But faulty breathing patterns can have the potential to cause sensations of nasal congestion as well, due to changes in carbon dioxide levels. As we improve our diaphragm breathing and slow our breaths per minute, the increase in the carbon dioxide levels may make a change in nasal congestion and allow better nasal breathing. One other problem with nasal breathing may be weakness of the muscles attached to the sidewalls of the nose. So the caudal mat maneuver shows the importance of these muscles. By pulling the soft tissue of the cheek next to the opening of the nose away from the nose, you open up that sidewall of the nose and nasal breathing is easier. If these muscles are weak from mouth breathing, they have, lost, they, they have lost their muscle tone and will take a while of nasal breathing to return that tone to normal, but is possible. So something to consider if you're having trouble with nasal congestion. Children with nasal blockage often breathe with their mouths open and their tongues laying flat on the bottom of their mouths. If mouth breathing is habitual, this can affect facial and skeletal growth, which could lead to oral facial and dental deformities. And this may be a link to the increased number of people with obstructive sleep apnea. Just putting it out there. We can't talk about breathing without talking about the brain. The brain functions are automatically linked to our breathing. Sometimes we get nervous or tense and those emotions can make us feel frustrated and short of breath. Our tension signals to our brain to move into the fight or flight mode with release of adrenaline. We do this because we're hardwired to protect ourselves when we feel this way. During acute episodes of anxiety and stress, it may make you bring your shoulders up and at times curl them forward to protect vital organs and your neck. It can make a person feel very vulnerable to open up their chest and relax when they want to curl up in a round ball and feel safe. When this happens, it's important to understand what's happening. It can happen out of nowhere and with no real reason. 
we're going to give you some tools and techniques to work through those feelings and that will help you know when you're tense then use your body awareness to bring you back to calm and relax in hopefully a shorter amount of time the brain is made up of a whole bunch of different parts but we're focused on the breath today and i'm not a neurologist so my focus is very very basic we're going to talk about two important parts of the brain related to breathing the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex to simplify things we're going to call the amygdala the emotional brain and the prefrontal cortex the rational brain the emotional brain lets us know when we're in danger and allows us to feel big emotions like happiness sadness anger and fear when we're in trouble it reacts fast the fight or flight response comes from this part of our brain along with the release of adrenaline the rational brain is the logic part of the brain and allows us to think things through properly, working with others and making good decisions. Having concrete and abstract tools to help with the breath and the triggers that can make us lose control of our diaphragm breathing makes us better equipped. Let's make a hand model of the brain to help you understand these two important parts of the brain. If you put your thumb in the middle of your palm and then curl your fingers over the top, you'll have a pretty handy model of the brain. Good joke, okay? Pretty handy model of the brain. Imagine the thumb as your emotional brain or amygdala. Remember, this is the part of the brain that lets you know when there's danger and lets you feel big emotions and the situations that are connected to them. It's an important part of the brain because it gets us out of danger quickly. It puts no thought into what needs to be done. Your fingers represent the rational brain or the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that allows you to make good rational decisions. When the rational brain is touching the emotional brain, we're able to stay calm and make rational decisions. When the amygdala is triggered, the oxygen in our brain goes there to respond quickly to the perceived threat and get us out of danger or to feel that big emotion. The oxygen can't go to the prefrontal cortex at the same time, so those rational calm thoughts cannot interfere with the function of the amygdala. It's as if the prefrontal cortex disengages from the amygdala, like we flip our lid and we may lose control of our calm breathing. If you're this man, the amygdala or emotional part of, of your brain is in charge now. We call this a fight or flight response. As our body tenses up, this signals the brain, which then provides the body with a burst of energy so that it can respond to the perceived dangers, dangers quickly. All of a sudden, the emotional brain and the ra rational brain are no longer working together. They're disengaged so we can respond as quick as possible to danger. But what if we signal the emotional part of our brain when there's no physical danger present? Breathing with the upper chest signals the brain we're stressed. Sometimes we have tension in our upper chest and this will signal the emotional part of our brain, just like the man running from the bear, but there's no bear. And what if we start to always breathe into our upper chest and rarely use our diaphragm? A breathing pattern disorder can develop, or even just a breathing pattern change can develop. What are those triggers that could change our breathing pattern? Faulty breathing patterns can be caused by a variety of for by a variety of reasons that prevent you from breathing with your diaphragm. If you look at the pictures and you look at the woman up on the top left hand side, she's wearing she wore too tight of clothes. And you can imagine back in the day when women had to wear corsets all the time, that really restricted the ability of their to, to use their diaphragm. So they would automatically start to breathe with their upper chest. Overworking your abs, looking for that six pack can also have that same effect. Having a history of physical abuse can also cause you to breathe in your upper chest. Chronic sinus problems or lung conditions, surgery or injury to your chest or abdomen, or even having to wear a mask during a pandemic. Whatever the cause, if our pattern of breathing becomes abnormal, then this could become our new normal and prevent us from getting those deep, satisfying breaths that we all need. Screen apnea, something new, well, not brand new, but certainly something that we're much more aware of now. 
and that's temporarily stopping breathing or shallow breathing while you're working or playing in front of a screen, computer screen. When you start typing on a keyboard, you may breathe in and breath hold, which can cause an irregular breathing pattern. You need to be aware of your breath while working on the computer and breathe. And it's really important to even monitor yourself while you're doing it because you'll be amazed at how often you hold your breath, depending on what you're looking at on the, on the computer screen. We need to reteach the body what it's like to be at rest. And that's a quote from Tanya Clifton Smith, who's the Bradcliffe founder. Breathing properly through the nose and with the diaphragm is not as simple as it might sound. Some people haven't been using their diaphragm for so long, their physiology is set to that new normal, and we need to reteach the body. We need to learn what it's like to be at rest. How do we change our breathing pattern to be more efficient and satisfying and build a foundation for better overall health? Correcting breathing pattern abnormalities may take time. Patience and practice are required. For those of you with underlying lung disease like asthma, COPD, or pulmonary fibrosis, breathing retraining will be a valuable part of your management plan as it will make a relevant and important contribution to your overall wellness. So we should breathe as adults, we should breathe at 10 to 14 breaths per minute. Faster than that should make you ask, why am I breathing faster? Am I using my diaphragm? Have I had too much coffee? We're gonna to talk too much about caffeine today, but keep that in mind. Increased coffee, increased sugar changes your um, breathing rate and heart rate as well, and increases risk of anxiety. Am I too hot? Am I stressed? Awareness is key. Awareness of our body, of our breathing pattern, and tension in our body is so important. Knowing you're tense and releasing that tension can sometimes be enough to release the pressure we're feeling, allowing you to breathe deeper and calmer. You can't breathe more efficiently, efficiently without starting with basics. I'm just gonna make a comment right here about extreme breathing techniques like box breathing, Wim Hof, Uteko, all those different kinds of breathing methods. They quite often include breath holding and counting breath in and out. And sometimes the breath holding may make things worse. These techniques can incorporate breath holding, which may be a problem already for some of you, especially in those with lung disease. So it's important to start with the basics of breathing up and improve the diaphragm breathing before we start to incorporate any of the extreme breathing methods. So this brings us to step one of breathing retraining. So every hour, it's important to check in on with ourselves. This body check will send a signal to your brain that you're fine and calm and will turn off that amygdala and the resulting adrenaline. So important to be body aware to avoid the risk of losing control. Stop what you're doing, drop and roll back those shoulders, flop, relax all over. Stop, drop, flop, relax all over. Sometimes doing a forward fold is a good idea because you can just hang those arms down and it's a physical change in position or leaving, leaning on a high counter or desk to prop up those shoulders and take pressure off the lungs. Another point to consider throughout the day is when, you, when we do have feelings of stress, anxiety, anger, think about this, name it, tame it, reframe it. Example, name it, I'm feeling scared, tame it, breathe out and relax, reframe it, maybe changing location for a short time, going to the bathroom and sitting, to ease the feelings and help you to process easier. Just something to think about. But every hour, it's to just remind yourself to do a posture check. Step two, the mantra of Bradcliffe is when in doubt, breathe out. Throughout the day, if you're feeling tense or short of breath, the long exhale sends a message to the whole body to relax and allows you to reset your breathing. It readies you for diaphragm breaths. Do this as often as you need throughout the day to help regain control of your breathing in your mind. You may even be able to catch feelings of anxiety early and decide what to do before problem solving seems impossible. Step three, sit up straight. We can't breathe deep into our lungs if we have eye posture. We call it eye posture now because of the, um, like the increased use of devices. Remember where the lungs are and the diaphragm. If we're slouching, the air can't go in. 
The eye hump is a new thing, but a very real thing, which develops from looking down at your devices or sitting poorly while working on your computers. And the eye hump is actually a little hump that happens just at the top of our back, below our neck. And you can see it if you start to have too much downward um, strain on your neck looking down at devices. Number four, make sure you breathe through your nose. As we talked about, the nose is an amazing and very important thing. We need to keep our nose clear and use it. If our nose isn't clear and it's full of mucus, we won't be able to take a nice big calming breath when we want to. Nasal saline irrigation can be useful along with steam inhalation. There are maneuvers that may help clear your nose immediately just through changing the rate and depth of your breathing. The resulting change in carbon dioxide constricts those blood vessels in the nose and helps clear the passages. And there, those are maneuvers you can try on your own. Basically, you're just taking normal breaths, holding your breath for a period of time, letting it out, and doing that five or six times in a row and allowing the carbon dioxide to rise just enough to clear out that nose. But most important is keep that nose clear. Step five. So as we said, a healthy, calm diaphragm breath comes through the nose and deep to the bottom of our lungs, which makes our stomach stick out a bit. It takes practice and to get good at diaphragm breathing. So how we approach the breathing retraining is really, this is key. Late, like practice and doing this maneuver probably twice a day. We're not wanting you to focus on your breathing 24 seven. We want you every hour to take a five second check of your breathing, but we want only just two five to 10 minute um, training sessions where you're actually practicing diaphragm breathing. The reason we need you to practice is because you're trying to change a breathing pattern that you've probably haven't been using for a long time. So we wanna change from an, an ineffective or less effective breathing method with the upper chest to a nice low slow breathing method using the diaphragm so i want you to lay down with your knees bent to take the pressure off your lower back and arms above your head to recruit the lower chest muscles to work easily and relax relax breathe for one to two minutes stay laying flat but with the arms down by the sides palms down and add a weight, maybe one to two kilogram wheat pack or bag of rice on your stomach. Concentrate on abdominal breathing in and out through the nose. Be aware of the gentle rise and fall of the weight as you breathe in with a relaxed pause at the end of the exhale. Visualize, weight, visualize waves and continue this maneuver for about three to five minutes. Then you're gonna switch the weight to the upper chest and continue with gentle abdominal breathing in and out through the nose. Concentrate on the stillness of your upper chest for three to five minutes. We don't want that upper chest to be moving. We want you to get that feeling of the belly going up and down, up and down. Now, when you've done this for three to five minutes, that's your 10 minute session. So you get up slowly in case you feel lightheaded. Don't sit up fast. And you do this two 10 minute practice sessions per day. So the two minute calm down bliss out can be used before you start your day or any time throughout the day. Counting breaths during times of high stress, worry, or when having trouble falling asleep can help bring calm. So I want you to prepare. So we're not gonna do this right now, but this is how you would perform the two minute calm down bliss out. I want you to prepare performing a full body stretch. Locate a quiet place and sit comfortably on the chair. Plant, plant your feet firmly on the floor. Place your hands on your lap. Make sure that your bottom is right against the back of the chair and relax your shoulders and your stomach. Exercise, the first exercises are just to tuck in your chin and hold it for five seconds and release. Drop the jaw for three seconds and release and close your mouth softly. Stretch those fingers of one hand then the other. Make sure to separate your fingers and stretch your stretch really hard, especially the thumb. Really get a good stretch. Then you're gonna focus on breathing. And I want you to focus on quiet breath, in and out through the nose. 
try to feel your waist expand gently, breathing in and out gently. Don't hold the breath at the peak of the inhalation. Notice the small relaxed pause at the end of the exhale, but don't hold the breath, just let it go. To still your busy brain, concentrate on silently counting, counting numbers at the end of each breath. This can be done with the eyes closed or with the eyes open while focusing on a particular object. Do not try to stop your thoughts. Simply concentrate on the rhythmic flow of numbers. Start by the numbering at one and move up to 10, then back down to one. When you come back to one, stretch, smile, and enjoy the calm. These are just a list of references and books you may want to, um, to take a look at. Um, they're available online, but also if you have any questions, you can always email me and, and we, can, we can get you specifics about something that you guys are looking for. So this ends my presentation. I'm hoping that you um, got something out of the presentation. And I'm hoping that if you have any questions, I can help um, answer them and expand on anything you wanted. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you about this topic. Thank you so much, Donna. We really appreciate uh, your presentation tonight. Uh, you certainly have inspired me to stop, drop, flop, and breathe out nice and slow. Uh, so we have lots of time uh, this evening for our questions and answers. Um, so if you have questions for Donna, please don't be scared to ask them. Remember, chances are someone else has the same question as you or a similar question. You can simply type your question if you haven't already done so in the, in the question feature on the uh, software there. So Donna, we have a couple questions to start. Um, the first question is, is it common when you're practicing diaphragmatic breathing and you're becoming really relaxed for that to initiate a yawn? Absolutely. Um, as you're starting to expand your lung function, like just get more air into those lungs, sometimes that's exactly what happens is that you're just, your, your lungs are responding, your body's responding with a yawn. Interestingly enough though, a yawn can be a sign that you're not breathing as efficiently as you should. So it can actually, if you're yawning a lot or sighing a lot during the day, that could actually be a sign that you're not getting a nice efficient deep breath with your diaphragm. So it could be a signal that you need to practice how to do your diaphragm okay. breathing, yeah. Okay, okay, that makes good sense, thank you. Yeah. All right, um, you referenced the book Breath by I think James Nestor. Is there, um, can you comment more on this resource? Is this one that you'd recommend to, pe to people that are trying to um, start their journey with diaphragmatic breathing, utilizing the Bradcliffe method? Yeah, so you know, the, the, the book Breath is, um, it, it's, a, it's really a more of a scientific and historical book about breathing. Um, and it's a personal examination by the author. He's a journalist, James Nestor, and he really did a personal journey and developed this book with lots of history of where, you know, where the different breathing techniques have gone, come, through, come into play. Um, and it specifically contrasts the differences between mouth breathing and nose breathing and the importance of nasal breathing. So it's much more of a sciencey book as opposed to a self-help book. The other book I referenced is called um, Breathing Matters, and it's written by Dr. Jim Bartley. And um, Tanya Clifton Smith is the co-founder of Bradcliffe, and she's a physiotherapist. So she's I mean, the two of them developed that book, and that really is more of a self-help book. You can um, get lots of information about the physiology and the basics of breathing, but then how to do the basic breathing techniques that I discussed as well. But a little bit more detail into um, stretching exercises, relaxation exercises, um, self-massage, and, um, and just maybe a, a bit more uh, of a self-help book. And I, I would recommend that one. So the, so the 
Breathing Matters was written in New Zealand, that book, and you can get it off of the Amazon website. I, I don't think it's available in any, in any bookstores in Canada. I had trouble getting um, my copy and I got it actually through um, somebody coming from New Zealand. So, um, but I have seen and checked that it's available on Amazon and it's available electronically as well on the Kindle or um, iPad uh, devices. And then the breath book of the new science of a lost art by James Nestor. That one's available on Amazon or um, you can, lots of local bookstores have that one now as well. So okay, yeah. perfect. And, yeah. and if people yeah. are looking for more resources, um, Donna has kindly provided um, us a handout, um, the breathing retraining handout, uh, you know, it really summarizes what um, Donna talked about in the presentation. We will make sure that everyone gets access to that resource. Um, we'll also send everyone a recording of this webinar in the coming days. Um, and, and Donna, with that, um, you had mentioned physiotherapists uh, because we have a lot of people saying, you know, how can I get in touch with a Bradcliffe um, uh, practitioner? Um, I feel like I, I really could use some further help with this. So can you expand a little bit on where people can seek help? Yeah, so we so I talked to I mean I don't have access to every physiotherapist that that uses I mean I, I know the ones who have trained in Bradcliffe, but I don't know all of the physiotherapists that are using diaphragm breathing um, training in their practice. But I do have a few names, and and so we've got some names that I gave to Jill, and I have their permission to share their names. There's um, two physiotherapists in Regina, I mean Saskatoon, who work at Zone Sport Physiotherapy. Um, Brad Spokes and and um, I think it's Amanda, um, I can't remember the name, so sorry, but but there's two names on that list. Then there's uh, there's another uh, two physios in Prince Albert who have mentioned that they have an interest in, in, um, in uh, diaphragm breathing. Uh, Christina Charles is at Freedom Physio and uh, Allison Kamchi is AC Physiotherapy, and they've they we've sent a lot of referrals to them to help patients with their with their breathing. Um, at, and for anybody that's in Alberta, um, Jessica Demars is in Calgary. She um, is with a um, her company or her physio group is um, I think it's called Breathe Well Physiotherapy, and they actually have um, lots of of um, really big resources for diaphragm breathing and long COVID, post-COVID um, patients do a lot, they do a lot of work with those patients. So that's another resource. And um, then Shelly Prosco in Saskatoon as well. She is a, um, she's a physiotherapist and does yoga, incorporates that. And so lots of work with breath with her as well. So, and then... And then I thought we would be able to share my email if anybody had questions or if anybody's in our in the area and they want to come and see me, we can certainly um, see them for a more thorough evaluation. I mean, you have to, we just wanted to introduce diaphragm breathing today. It's definitely not a, a deep enough um, session that we can get into unless you're sitting face to face with somebody and and kind of getting a look at how the breathing pattern is and how you're feeling and what your symptoms are and all of that uh, because everybody's different but we just wanted to introduce it and then have you find those that area where you could maybe expand on your on your journey to better breathing so that was our intention i think there was another question jill as well about it yeah. did have vital capacity Improving. Yeah, there's a question about if um, you can provide breathing exercises to expand lung capacity. Right. So, so the lung capacity itself, like the the amount of capacity the lungs have, are going to be set. That's that's the way they are. How you use that capacity is really what we can improve on with our diaphragm breathing, but also with strengthening that diaphragm. And I have a, I did have that slide that talked about the. Um, the Power Breathe device and the AeroSure device and the AeroBika. The AeroBika was is really more for um, clearance of mucus. If you have a lot of mucus, and some of you may deal with a lot of mucus, and so you imagine if your lung lungs are full of mucus or have a, a large amount of mucus every day, that that's going to decrease the capacity of your breathing. You're going to not have that breath. 
all the time. So that's something that you may want to kind of explore. How can I get rid of this mucus? Then I'll have a bigger breath. I'll increase my capacity in, in a sense. Um, and then with the with the power breathe and the AeroSure, those two devices are actually strengthening the diaphragm. You have to be able to use, and as I mentioned, you have to be able to use your diaphragm to be able to, to really get the best benefit of those two devices. But they're definitely um, something that, that patients have really, really benefited with COPD, asthma, um, pulmonary fibrosis, in, interstitial lung disease, all those different diseases. And, and we've actually noticed that post-COVID patients really have, some of them have really had a, um, a decrease in the function of their diaphragm after such a, um, it, depending on their course and if they were in hospital and then de depending on the severity of the disease. But um, definitely the, the diaphragm is much weaker than it should be. So that, that's where we want to move into training that diaphragm, get it moving and then strengthen it. And, and um, the Power Breathe Inspiratory Muscle Trainer is available through Jessica DeMar's, um, her physio group out in Calgary. They have free shipping across um, anywhere in Canada. And, and they have um, the starter inspiratory muscle trainer. It's called the Power Breathe. And it is um, starts at about $105 and then, and then uh, free shipping. And then uh, the AeroSure, I can only find it available on Amazon. And it's about $130. And it has uh, shipping added to it. So those are two, I mean, definitely not going to change the capacity of your lung, but you're gonna feel like you have because you've improved the, the, the diaphragm strength and then can get bigger breaths and really it would make a big difference. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Donna. It's so good to know that there's tools and resources and things that we can do um, to help ourselves feel better. Uh, certainly, there's so many people that have been impacted um, by COVID and experiencing long-term symptoms. So I'm grateful for your explanation there. Uh, we have another question here, Donna. Will you talk a little bit more about CO2 and nasal congestion? Also about other ways that you can relieve nasal congestion. Oh, you sure. talked about in the presentation about yeah. how keeping the nose clear is really key. Yeah, so clear. Um, so key. Um, I had to laugh because today I was talking to a patient at work about uh, keeping their nose clean, and I pulled out my very amazing book I got back in the '90s, um, and it's it was my children's bedtime storybook. I always said because. If they had a stuffy nose, I'd say, look, kids, this is what's happening in your nose. And they <laughs> roll their eyes, I'm sure. They, they still roll their eyes when they think about it. But the nose, we need that nose clear so that we can really get that, draw that breath in. And it signals to the brain and to our body that, okay, we're, we're, we're going to have a nice cleansing breath. And so um, the, the, the one thing about um, clearing the nose quickly is that it, um, it will clear quickly and decongest just with the increase in carbon dioxide. And that's why we talk about that, that little maneuver where you're, you're holding your breath for, um, for a period of time. So you, you breathe out, then you take a breath in, you hold it, and you hold it for as long as you can, you let it up. So as you do that over five or six breaths, your carbon dioxide rises. And then at the end of the, of the five or six um, cycles, you, you may find that your nose has decongested. If you have a crooked nose, if you have a broken nose, then of course that's not going to help. But if you if you have a clear nose but just inside the tissue is a little bit congested, it will make a difference. But other things to keep in mind is that um, nasal steroids are are um, kind of a mainstay of people that have allergies or um, chronic um, sinus trouble or that kind of thing. So that congestion needs to be relieved and, and nasal steroids do a really good job of that. Um, that's a prescription. The one thing to make sure you don't do, and we do find a lot of people that do this, is they buy an over-the-counter product like Dristan, Otrovan, um, or Drixoral, and they use that because their nose is plugged. So they use those device, those um, products. They'll get great relief because it's a quick acting eight hour, um, lasts about eight hours and it decongests and, and then people find, oh, this is awesome. I can breathe through my nose. 
The problem is, is that after using any of those products for more than three to five days, you get rebound stuffiness. So your nose then becomes dependent on that drug and it will become dependent throughout the day. So then you may find that using that medication, you're actually causing yourself to have more nasal stuffiness and it now becomes during the day instead of maybe just at night. And it, and it becomes that you need that all the time. So you have to think, okay, if I'm using this, how am I gonna get off of this drug? And you're gonna to have to, some of our patients have gone cold turkey, just said, okay, I'm just gonna stop it. I can do it. They really struggle for a few days and then their nose starts to come back to normal, but they may need na nasal steroids to, to wean themselves off of, the, of those over-the-counter drugs. So really be aware that those can cause nasal stuffiness. And then another um, product that we like to recommend is the nasal rinse. Neomed makes a great product. There's lots on the market, different products, but it's just a saline wash um, that you can use to rinse your nose with salt water, which is a great way to, to get rid of any um, congestion, mucus, that kind of thing, get it out of there. And, um, and then even if a person really doesn't like to put anything up their nose, you can even just steam hot water over sit over top of a, of a hot um, water with maybe some um, just I mean we just use hot water but you can use a little bit a teaspoon of um, Vicks Vapor Rub even just the menthol and you can lean over it and it can give you a nice um, decongesting steam so that's another option so other than I mean it, again it depends if there's a structural reason why your nose is stuffy but those are just tips that might help Oh, that's wonderful. Look at all the stuff you know just about the nose, Donna. You can just give us breathing nose. tips, medication yeah, yeah. tips, <laughs> medication not to use, medication that may work, as well as some over-the-counter or some simple yeah. do-at-home. So thank you for oh, that. Yeah, and I, I think, too, we talked about that caudal method. Um, I couldn't describe it very well without, you know, being in front of you all, but it, the caudal method to deca just to see if it's, if it's, um, makes a difference to pull your nose uh, if it's just tightness in there and you just tug on the side of your nose nostrils and you pull away from towards your cheek and and if you start to feel like oh okay that really opens up my nose then you know it's just either narrowing you just have a very narrow nose or you're just congested and so that kind of gives you an idea that okay I've got a I can work on this and then um, and the breathe right nasal strips are an awesome way to kind of help to on a, when you've got a stuffy nose, say you've got a cold or something like that, you can use a breathe like nasal strip and that's what that does. It spreads that nostril out so you can get more air. Okay, because sometimes Love people- the might... nose. To yes. the nose all day. <laughs> I'm gonna say, we could do a webinar on the nose. Sure, um, yeah. So Donna, um, you talked about congestion. So, so am I understanding this correctly too, that sometimes people, doesn't congestion doesn't necessarily mean that you will have a runny nose. And so right. that's why people might want to try some of those other maneuvers and techniques to see if they feel better, can breathe deeper and more yeah. fully through the nose. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So moving away from the nose, um, are you aware of any apps that measure your breath rate? Oh goodness, there's so many. Um, I don't. I mean, we there. Hmm. Depending on so so if we look at if we look at these apps, they talk about the proper breath rate and, and and I know that at the beginning of the webinar we talked about normal breathing 10 to 14 breaths a minute for adults. And and when we talk about that, we have to remember those are people that don't have an underlying lung problem, like a major lung problem. So if we have someone with um with interstitial lung disease or COPD. That, or even someone with asthma that's not well controlled, the, their breathing rate's gonna naturally be higher. And so to, to, um, to have a, an app that measures the, the breath rate, it's difficult to kind of find one for everybody. So, um, but there are different, and I honestly, I don't usually suggest any just because there's so many out there. You find one that you like, um, a lot of them tend to, to kind of look into the, the realm of a circle kind of getting bigger and smaller with every breath and bigger and smaller and it's counting and it's allowing you a breath you know say they're counting two seconds in four seconds out 
two seconds in, four seconds out. So it's it's kind of trying to get you to slow your breathing. Um, but sometimes you just need to have to find your rate and and slow it down at your own rate and not have an app to tell you what that rate is. You don't follow that rate because that might make you more uncomfortable. So, um, but I but I I think there are so many out there that that may um, may kind of you could work with. Um, we did have a, a, a an app that we we um, suggested for some people, and it's a it really like the people that that downloaded it and used it tended to find that the that the they they just couldn't get in sync with the app. And so it deterred from what they were trying to do, which was just trying to slow and calm their breathing down. So that's the other thing to remember is that you want to find where you are comfortable and then work with that and slow that breathing down. But keeping that rhythm of um, of a one to two ratio of a breath in, if you're breathing in for one, you're out for two or breathing in for two and out for four, that kind of thing. Awesome. It's more so focusing on slowing the breath down and we're all different. So we need to listen to our physical intelligence too. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Exactly. All right. Well, this is a yeah. great question. Uh, another one for you, Donna, completely different. So if a patient is on oxygen uh, via nasal prongs and they're not breathing effectively through their nose, um, are they in fact then getting less oxygen than they would otherwise with the nasal prongs? Well, uh, so depend. I mean, if the nose is completely blocked, then, then we have to wonder if they're getting anything through the nasal cannula. But we have to remember, just because you can't necessarily feel a comfortable breath through your nose, but the, the air can go, it's just not comfortable. We have to remember that that oxygen is flowing from the machine through the hose and, and kind of to simplify, it's blowing it into the back of your throat. So we're blowing it to the back of our throat, the oral pharynx, and then from there, your breath is taking it into your lungs. So even though it feels like, oh man, I just can't get that big deep breath in, that you have to remember it's going to be at the back of your throat, not at the tip of your nose once it starts flowing. Does, does that make sense? I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Thanks, Donna. Yeah. Okay. Uh, switching gears, uh, we were you were talking a little bit about um, uh, mucus production in the in the presentation and in the Q and A a little bit. Um, this is a question: uh, Should people quitting smoking expect increased mucus during this process? So sometimes, so this is someone that's trying to quit smoking and they're experiencing more mucus. When yeah. So. Some people experience more mucus, some do not. Just if, uh, And again, there's no, we don't know why. Some would develop more mucus than others when they start to quit smoking. Um, good for you to you know, go on that journey because it's, a, I mean, you have to commit and you have to, it'll be a hard job, but the effects will be amazing when you're done um, as, you, as you go through that journey of quitting smoking. But um, I think that someone, just because you don't bring up mucus doesn't mean anything's wrong. It just means that, so possibly what happens is when you smoke, you're producing mucus in response to smoking. So when you quit smoking, the lungs are going, oh, this is good. I don't have, I don't have to produce mucus because I'm, I'm not being irritated all the time by those cigarettes. So, so there is that fact. And then some people may have just, you know, start to, their lungs are starting to clear things out and they may have mucus, but not for a long time. They may have mucus just for a little while as they have quit smoking. So, so there's some have none, some have a little bit, and then some continue to have mucus. They had mucus when they smoked and they have mucus after they quit smoking. And that may just be an indication of just some, a little bit of change in that lung function. Maybe it's not working quite as good as it used to because the, just the, the lung has been maybe a little bit damaged from smoking, but but that mucus, we need that mucus to clear. And that's important for us to always remember, you have to know, am I somebody who coughs every day and I need to make sure I keep an eye on that mucus or am I a person that never coughs and oh, now when I start to cough, then that's a sign that something's wrong. So, so you know, you kind of, kind of, again, if you got me started on mucus, we could go on for a long time. <laughs> 
So now we need a webinar on the nose and a webinar on mucus. Perfect. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Donna. We have another question about some of the devices. I know you discussed them yeah. in your presentation, highlighted a few. Um, yeah. This question is about an incentive spirometer. Is, does incentive spirometry still have a role in improving breathing, or is that really an old school way of practice? Yeah, you know, um, the one thing about the incentive spirometer was that you breathed in, held your breath, and then you breathed out. And with breathing problems, we don't want people to hold their breath. And with COPD, we don't, and, and with asthma that's not well controlled or asthma that's quite bad, um, we don't want you to hold your breath because we want that air to come out. If we, if we have somebody with COPD, we know that they, that they don't get rid of their breath as easy. So we talk about percent breathing, we talk about long exhalations to really empty those lungs. And if we talk about, an incentive spirometer, taking a breath in, holding it, and then breathing out, as that's what the incentive spirometer is to really get air to the deep down into those lungs. Then, then now we've we may have trapped more air by using that incentive spirometer, and that's that's a problem. So we so we really don't. I'm I'm not a big. I, I'm a big fan of spirometers when they're used for um, somebody who's just had surgery in their belly and they don't want to breathe deep. And so we need them to breathe deeper so that they're, they you know, get that breath down in their lungs and, and, and really that may expand their belly. And, and so that's what we're trying to do with incentive and spirometer. But when we're talking about improving lung function and, in, and really improving the strength in someone with COPD or asthma or in or, or with um, interstitial lung disease, we, we don't want, um, breath holding at all we want we want breath in and breath out and we in and out that nice rhythmical pattern and even with the in, um, in uh, power breathe devices those ones that are strengthening that diaphragm it's just again a breath in and a breath out except it's against resistance so that's the difference the incentive in spirometer is saying take a breath in hold it and then blow out whereas the um, power bead device and the arrow shear device they're literally uh, resistance is higher so your your diaphragm has to be stronger to bring the breath through the device so it's more like a weightlifting for the diaphragm oh that's that's a good way to to think of it that's awesome thanks yeah. donna um can you explain um because you mentioned it briefly here and there are some questions in, in the question feature here um people want to know the difference between diaphragmatic breathing and purse slip breathing okay so both are great techniques to use when you have a chronic lung disease um the diaphragm breathing is to get the air in right so we want to get, get a nice big deep breath or not we want to get a nice deep breath in and we're using the diaphragm to do that because it's that strongest muscle we've got in our body for breathing the purse of breathing is used when we breathe out, and that's to provide a little bit of back pressure to splint open or open up those airways so more air can come out. So again, to get rid of that trapped air or that, that air that's kind of stuck down in the bottom of our lungs, especially if we have um, an asthma that's a little bit out of control or a COPD patient that's got a lot of, you know, really struggling with their breath. So, so we have to use both. And we have to um, we have to think when when we think about um, especially COPD when you when you have trapped air in our lungs and I and I I hope everybody understands what that means it's not like um, it's not like it's trapped and it's you know hammering on the side of your lung going let me out of here <laughs> but it's just the the air the last breath can't quite come out of the lung on its own because the the air tubes are they're not as springy as they used to be and so they kind of they're kind of floppy and sometimes they they flop closed before the breath came out so now you've got a little bit of air stuck in the lungs still does that kind of make sense we always use the the kind of the description um nice springy lungs young lungs that are healthy you 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 can liken it to a balloon you blow into a balloon and the air goes into the balloon and you let go of the neck of that balloon and the air just flies out because the balloon is elastic and it pushes the air out if you think of COPD lungs, you think of a paper bag. You blow the air, it goes in great um, through into the paper bag. But when I open the neck of that bag, 
I have to squish the bag to get rid of all that air in that bag because it doesn't have that springiness. So, so if you if you um, don't get all your air out, you're going to have some trapped in that in that lung still. And the person that breathing kind of splints open those air tubes and allows the air to come out. So it's it's easier to get the next breath because you've got more room. So awesome. and the, and the other thing about that diaphragm breathing with COPD especially is that if you have a lot of trapped air in that lung, it's going to flatten that diaphragm. That flat that we taught we showed that video where it had the dome of the diaphragm. And that dome shape of the diaphragm isn't always there for people with COPD because they've got so much trapped air. So we really with them, we really want to work on getting that air all the way out. And that's why we talk about that breath out. Um, and then your your diaphragm can dome up a little bit and then you can strengthen it a little bit better and it'll get stronger and stronger. And, and that's something that um, COPD patients might really notice if they really worked on getting all that air out with a purse lip grit breath and then using their diaphragm breathing techniques to get the air back in. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Donna. Yeah. Uh, we have some questions about positional uh, breathing. You did talk about relieving some of the tension in the shoulders, perhaps like leaning over a, a counter or a table. Uh, this person is asking, is it, help, is it helpful to stand uh, while working at a computer to get more of that diaphragmatic breathing versus sitting all day at the office? Uh, so de definitely um, the posture is going to be better standing. Um, I mean, we, we oh, man, watching people work at the desk all the time, it, it's hard to watch sometimes if I, I walk by some of my uh, coworkers and they've been at their desk for hours and, and the, their posture is just like a little slump. Like they're just like a little ball at the desk and it, they can't, I mean, how are you going to die from breathe and how are you going to get a nice relaxing breath if you're, if you're all curved up and we talked about the eye posture and eye hump, all of those things. Posture is so important. And so if you, if you find that you're sitting at your desk and it's awesome that there's so many more sit stand desks available so that there's up and down because you don't want to stand all day i mean people that stand all day have a lot of hip and back lower back discomfort but if you think about a sit stand desk then yes you're going to stand up you're going to be stretching you're going to be able to loosen those shoulders you may be able to lean on the desk but again depending on your setup i don't know how strong they are to lean on it but you're going to be changing your posture which is going to allow you to get a better diaphragm breath um, but even if you don't have a sit-stand desk, even uh, sitting at your computer every hour when we talk about doing your, your breath check, even standing up and leaning against your desk or just standing up, loosening everything up, doing a, a forward fold and just, just letting yourself you know, have a nice relaxation of that upper chest, you'll notice that it, it's a, a lot better to do that every hour as opposed to sitting there because we can get mesmerized with the work, right? You can just hour after hour after hour and before you know it three hours gone by and you haven't even moved it's like oh dear you haven't moved in three hours that's not good so no. yeah so changing posture um i don't know that like i think there's got to be a mix you've got to be able to sit up nice and tall sitting at a, a computer but if you're starting to get kind of tired and slouchy then standing up and if you have that opportunity with a sit stand desk that's an awesome an awesome option Oh, that's great advice. Thank you. And Donna, I think you can help with this because not only oh, with no. your respiratory therapy background, but I know you're a runner because I've gone on some runs with you. So yeah. this individual has had a hard time bre using their diaphragmatic breathing while they're running. Can you provide some advice on how to improve on their breathing while they're running? Yeah, well, um, there is, you know, um, we have some information about exercising with with uh, with Bradcliffe and and kind of working on that. And I and I can always send that resource as well. But one thing to remember is um, your diaphragm. I think I think what we tend to worry about is while we're running and diaphragm breathing, we need to breathe through our nose and 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 make it that like nice relaxing breath. And we have to remember that's not always going to happen when you're running. You may have to breathe through your mouth but using your diaphragm. 
So, and you're going to have to, depending on your speed of your run or up a hill or that kind of thing, you have to remember, you're going to engage the other muscles of your breathing. It's not always going to be diaphragm 100% of the time. I say 90% of the time we should be using our diaphragm, but that that's like when we're not exercising. So, so when we're, when we're not doing the exercising, that's where we should be using our diaphragm more. But when we start to exercise, um, I think sometimes we get a little, we think, okay, now I've got to, I've got to use that diaphragm while I'm running. You do definitely do, but you have to remember, you're going to have to engage your running, you're running faster, harder, stronger uphills and, and, and that kind of thing. So you need to also be using the upper chest muscles. And, and so the diaphragm, if you're practicing your diaphragm breathing and you feel like you've got a good handle on your diaphragm breathing at rest, then then it's probably working while you're running and you, 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 you've got to expect that you're going to be using the rest of your muscles as well. Just thinking, okay, I want to stay relaxed. But I do have resources if, if you need more information and they can, they can reach out to you, Jill, if they want or, um, and I can send that, that information. Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll make sure that all of the resources that we talk about today will be emailed out uh, to everyone. Yeah. You okay. know, the, one, one, oh, sorry, one other thing about that exercise is, is sometimes you have to also, we don't want to think about our breathing too much when we're running, but sometimes we hold our breath during a powerful um, part of the run. So say you have a, like a, a two block hill that you have to go up and it's near the middle of your run. And you might just think, oh my goodness, here we go, we've got to do this hill. And it just, it's a killer. So you start to run up the hill, but you take a breath and you, you may actually hold your breath up that hill thinking, okay, I'm gonna run and you don't take a breath. And if you're not breathing while you're running up that hill, you're obviously gonna run out of breath pretty darn quick. So, so that may also be something that you pay attention to while you're exercise running, running cross country skiing, cycling, all of those things that you're not holding your breath and that might be limiting your thinking you're not using your diaphragm because you're not using any muscles. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. A lot of people just out of not thinking about it might hold their breath when there's harder work and you see that yes. kind of strength training too. So that, yeah, that's a really exactly. good point. Yeah. Okay. So um, this, this is a question um, that several people have had and, and I know in the past on, I know I've asked you this question too, for habitual upper chest a, um, accessory muscle breathers, so they're not typically using their diaphragm, how long would it take to retrain the body? So if you're doing that 10 minute session twice a day, like you talked about, you're doing your hour checks, how long until your brain kind of goes, oh, okay, this is what we do. And that diaphragm gets really strong and, and starts to, to, to work better for us. Okay, well, that's a tough one. <laughs> I think it's going to get better. It's going to get better right away. I mean, obviously, because you, you're starting to use it. And, and, and uh, I know that it's usually takes, is it six weeks or eight weeks before a new, a new, um, when you're trying it to, to change a habit, it takes about six or eight weeks before it becomes less of a, of a chore, to, like it'd be less in your mind. But, but honestly, with diaphragm breathing, it, it is a, uh, it becomes less obvious that you're that you're thinking about it every hour because you just all of a sudden you're not having to drop your shoulders because you check every hour and all of a sudden you're going well oh, I'm not even tense that's awesome so so right there like within a few weeks you might notice that that's gone like you're not having that tension with your shoulders up every time you check every hour um, and then the diaphragm itself if you if you've got really good control of that diaphragm and, and you do a couple of sessions and you and you got that book moving up and down or whatever you've got the weight on your tummy and you're you're noticing that oh I've got this I'm like I'm good and you may find that in a couple of weeks but then there may be times where you you go you revert back like you get maybe you get a little back injury or you get some t tension in your back or or you're, you just don't feel like you've got that diaphragm breathing down quite right again. So you might have to re go back to the, to the basics and start again. But the other thing is if you 
are trying. We had a patient today. She's been trying and trying for about four weeks to get the diaphragm breathing just with the exercise that we gave her. And she's just struggling. And, and part of that could be from underlying muscle tension that's just not allowing that diaphragm to move as freely as we'd like it to, to move. And, and so upper and lower back tension, uh, muscle tension can cause that limit. And if that's the case, then we want to see a physio or see a massage therapist or somebody that can. And then the, I have to say that that um, self-help book from uh, Breathing Matters from Dr. Bartley, excellent ideas on stretching and, and really relaxing those muscles to help you to move that diaphragm better. So, so those are all the things that can limit how fast or the kind of decrease the speed with which you, you master diaphragm breathing. And, but, but you're going to notice improvement. I have to say um, most of the people that, that really get into the diaphragm breathing, they, they practice and they find that it's really helped within weeks. It's, it's not going to take long. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to make a difference. You'll notice it. And I think with, you know, with all of you that have underlying lung disease, that, that's what you're, I mean, that's what we want. We want you to find something that will give you um, some control over your breathing and maybe give you even just a little bit of relief from that shortness of breath on exertion or shortness of breath at rest. And, and, and this is not going to be the answer. It's not going to cure everything, but it's not going to hurt and it's going to, it'll make a difference. It really will. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I, you know, there's lots of people again asking about access to, you know, one-on-one -on -one, being able to see someone like you, yeah. uh, you know, if, if you miss this earlier, um, Donna has provided a list of practitioner that, that practitioners that she is aware of that can assist uh, people, certainly in Saskatchewan and then in Alberta as well. Uh, and then we'll provide um, the resources that Donna has mentioned as well in this webinar. So we will be emailing that out to everyone in the, yeah. in the coming days. Okay, so I have another question here. Um, yeah. Sometimes when I'm relaxing, I'll, I think I'm breathing fine and then all of a sudden I gasp, I take a gasp in of air. Um, could you maybe identify why this is? Do you see this in your practice? Oh yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, like it's like a yawn almost. It's not always a yawn, but it's like, oh, oh, I gotta take a breath. And and it's, uh, I mean, that's I'm making that dramatic, obviously, but um, it's it's if you, I I think the the key. It's very hard to self-diagnose that you're not breathing with your diaphragm. I mean, I've had people come to our office and, and I'll ask them, do you know how to diaphragm breathe? And they'll say, yes, I do. And you'll ask them to show you, okay, show me how you diaphragm breathe. And they don't diaphragm breathe. They don't know how to diaphragm breathe. They thought they did, but they don't. And and I think it's um, that sometimes that that's what's happening with, uh, with those gasping breaths. Are you your body's obviously wanting more oxygen, more air. Is it, it so? Are you really diaphragm breathing, or if you're, or are you breathing um, up high in your chest, or are you just maybe holding your breath and then your body just goes, okay, fine, that's enough. You got to take a breath. And again, we talked about all those times when you can stop breathing just with reading emails, looking down at your phone, um, you know, anything that's that's maybe just taking away from from that pattern of breathing that nice normal in and out low and slow and and then your body just goes okay we got to take a breath I don't know what you're doing but we got to take a breath so so I think that's that's really the key is that you have to kind of take a look or if you have a partner around have them watch you breathe and say okay how am I breathing like am I breathing up in my upper chest am I, am I like because even when we ask you to do that um, hand on your upper chest hand on your belly that's why I said, if you have somebody that can watch you, you'd be surprised at how you think that you've definitely done a belly breath and the person looking at you going, that didn't move at all. That hand didn't move, the upper hand moved. So, so I think that's important that you, you kind of have somebody watch you and say, no, nope, you are not breathing with your diaphragm. So just to help out, yeah. But it's that's really, awesome. that's why the one-on-one -on -one is so handy um, with a, even a one-time visit with a physio Physios are awesome in, in that sense that they even if they they're even if their primary focus isn't diaphragm breathing, they know all about it and they can help you to kind of say, okay, yeah, you are not diaphragm breathing, but we can help you to do that. So yeah. 
Yeah, that's great. And I loved how you mentioned earlier too that they can help loosen the muscles. There's so many muscles going on in the torso and in between yeah. the ribs or intercostal muscles and all that good stuff. So you, you never know what's tight until someone loosens it. Exactly. So yeah, that's, that's exactly. great. That's great advice, Donna. Okay, so this is a question specifically for you um, because you had mentioned that you yourself had a journey to learn how to diaphragm freeze. Um, the, you said implementing the Bradcliffe method for yourself. What changes did you notice um, in yourself after you, you were more aware of your breath? Oh, so um, let me think. So one of the first things was, um, you know, I probably appear pretty chill most of the time, but uh, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not always that chill. But you know when you're uh, when you've got a time crunch and and you've got to get something done by a certain time. You've got to get to a, a place at a certain time and you're behind and you're like having to hurry up. And and I I I find that just by incorporating diaphragm breathing, just at that one moment, it just everything just calms down. And it's interesting to me that that's all it takes is just nice and relaxed. Uh, breath with with my diaphragm allows everything to kind of of um, just refocus and and so you can focus back on okay it's I'm gonna I'm just gonna relax and I'm gonna get where I when I get there and that's that so so that's an interesting thing that that happened um, my hands used to be very cold all the time they are not cold at all anymore um, uh, and that's an interesting thing because. You know, you think, well, why would they have been cold? But but if you're not using a nice, relaxed breath, and I've got more tension in my upper chest, not as much blood flow to the hands, not as much, um, not as going to be as warm. Um, one of the biggest things, and and uh, that I really found interesting was with the and and for all of the women out there who have had babies, and even for women in general, men too, I suppose, um, but most of the issues are, are with postpartum uh, women, is the, the pelvic floor, we tend to under, um, we just, we don't even, people don't even talk about the pelvic floor, it's just, you know, just a part of the woman's body that the baby comes through and that's that. But if we think about the, the, the way the pelvic floor in, is actually working with the diaphragm, they, they work in unison. So if my diaphragm starts to work uh, really well and I and I'm using it and it's and it's I'm moving it up and down, we, we think, okay, well that's awesome that it, it, I'm using my diaphragm, but the, what's happening is it's also massaging the belly. I mean you have to think if my my diaphragm's going up and down, my belly's going to get a nice massage. might not have had that before. so so all my uh, internal organs might be a little happier, might work a little better. And then if we think about that, then the pelvic floor should will also, if we start to use diaphragm breathing and we and, and we get really, really good at it, then then the pelvic floor will also start to come in sync with that diaphragm. And that pelvic floor in a in in postpartum women, but again, it, it's even in in young women that haven't had any any um, children. The, the pelvic floor can get flat, just like our diaphragm can get flat and kind of wimpy, the, the pelvic floor can as well. And when that happens and you have, that's where our bladder control comes from. And if that, if that pelvic floor is, is not working properly and we have um, bladder problems, bladder leakage or um, leakage when we laugh or when we pick up a heavy object, we have bladder leakage or we just have the urgency to go all the time. We think that then we, we, we need to start working on that diaphragm and that pelvic floor all of a sudden starts to work better. And then we have better control because that now that pelvic floor isn't flat and if it's not flat, then when I need to hold my, my, my um, urine, I can because then it can tense up a muscle because it's not already tense. And that's a, a huge thing. So for me, that was a huge change. Um, there I've now bared my soul told you guys that I had bladder problems <laughs> but anyway <laughs> it's so awesome to share that because I think that we don't talk about it enough and it's made such a difference and and so I share that with my patients too if they have any issues with that it's a it's a really big uh a big, a, almost a side effect of diaphragm breathing because we think lungs with diaphragm breathing but but we have to think all total body 
Yeah, exactly. We can't separate. You talked about changes in your hands, right? Changes in yeah. in in relaxing your whole body, yeah. but then, and then also the pelvic floor. So so that's that's great. So yeah. I think I think now um, because it is getting it's right at eight thirty now. I think we can all take a breath out, as Donna would recommend, uh, because that's all the time that we have. So I just want to thank Donna so much for sharing some of her knowledge. Uh, her wisdom, her passion, and and your personal stories tonight, and certainly your time. We're we're so grateful. I feel like uh, we could ask you questions all night, Donna. Um, I also want to thank Joe from our Lung Association of Saskatchewan IT team, who is here tonight helping us, and then as well our amazing sponsors at GSK. And to all, all of you that joined, thank you so much for spending yeah, your evening you. with us. We hope that Thanks you can everybody. breathe. Yeah, yeah awesome. I hope you can breathe a little bit easier. Um, I did mention earlier um, our Lung Association of Saskatchewan support groups. If you're not already a member, please join us. We'd love to have you. Just find out more on our website, lungsas.ca. This That's where we'll post a lot of information about upcoming webinars such as this one. And then if you're also looking for a way to support the Lung Association of Saskatchewan, you can do so uh, by purchasing a Breathe and Win raffle ticket. You can not only support us, but have a chance to win. I checked earlier, our 50-50 was over $45,000. So that would be awesome to win. Yes. So purchase your ticket today and uh, you can do so again from our website, lungsas.ca. Thank you, Donna, and thank you to all of you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jill. Night. That's awesome. Bye, everybody. Take good care.